great. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you again for joining us today. It's really great to be back after a busy summer here at Friends. I welcome all of you who are new to our gorgeous wildlife series, and I thank everyone who is back and joined us for our spring series earlier this year. Today we're going to explore bat conservation in the gorge and the Pacific Northwest. With mouths full of sharp teeth and iconic wingspans that scream with Halloween fright, bats are unique and misunderstood. In celebration of International Bat Week, we are shedding light on these dark, mysterious flying mammals that are significant pollinators and pest controllers. Um, for fun, I have a little question here that I'd like to ask everybody. So you'll see a question pop up on your screen. Who has seen a bat in person before? Please choose which answer. We got a few coming in here. Oh, okay, here we go. Give you guys just a few more seconds. Again, if you'd like to, we got three options, choose one. Who has seen a bat in person before? All right. So we, we've got some, some folks that have seen bats around here. We got 62% of you who have seen bats many times, 37% just a few times, and about 4% have never seen a bat in person. Well, we're gonna see a lot in picture form, which will be fun. Um, here, I'll share those results real quick. And so, yeah, it's good to know. Thanks, thanks for doing that, you guys. Um, back to our presentation here. Um, my name is Natasha Stone. I am your host tonight. I am the Community Engagement Specialist at Friends of the Columbia Gorge. As Friends' Community Engagement Specialist, I manage our outdoor youth education efforts and work to build a diverse and inclusive network of community partners to help protect, preserve, and steward the Columbia Gorge. With me is our featured speaker, Abby Tobin. Abby Tobin is the White Nose Syndrome Coordinator for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, where she develops, coordinates, and implements bat conservation and white nose syndrome management and research activities. She has been working with Western bat species since 2008 in various positions for state and federal agencies. She received her master's degree from Northern Arizona University, where she investigated management and mitigation strategies to protect bat roosts. Abby was first drawn to bats through caving, temporarily visiting their homes. She was left with curiosity and a desire to support these critical yet poorly understood members of our ecosystem. Before I hand it off to Abby, I wanted to talk a little bit about friends and how we're all here right now for anyone who may have been invited to this webinar by a friend and are still getting to know us. Oh, I'm sorry, you guys. My presentation is not working for some reason. There we go, sorry about that. Um, before, excuse me, Friends of the Columbia Gorge is the only conservation group entirely dedicated to protecting, preserving, and stewarding the gorge. Friends led the fight to protect the gorge by helping create the Columbia River Gorge National Scenic Area over 40 years ago. And it's been working ever since to safeguard the gorge and make sure the natural wonders found today will be preserved for generations to come. Friends is entirely dedicated to protecting and enhancing the scenic, natural, cultural, and recreational resources of the gorge. In celebration of International Bat Week this week, as well as Friends' 40th year anniversary this year, ensuring the gorge remains a vibrant living place for both people and species such as bats, we produce gorgeous wildlife. Because many of us can't access the doors as easily right now, we wanted to bring the outdoors to you with some amazing wildlife that lives right here in the gorge. Um, a few webinars that I wanted to talk briefly about that are coming up that you guys might be interested in, um, Thursday, November 5th at 5.30, join us live with Michael Lang, Friends' Conservation Director, to discuss how the Gorge has changed in the past 30 years, what revisions have been made, and how they will impact the future of the Columbia River Gorge. We hope to inspire you with this conversation by talking about climate action, fish and wildlife habitat protection, limiting urban sprawl, and several more improvements to gorge protection. Second is sharing gorge stories through photography, November 12th at 5.30. Join us for a webinar, again live, featuring two incredible photographers, Paloma Ayala and Peter Marbach. Um, I think it'll be really interesting if you guys will enjoy it. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Abby. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and ask you, Abby, to share yours, and we'll get this started.
Great, thank you, Natasha. Can you uh, see my screen okay? Yes, looks. All right, awesome. Well, hi everyone. Um, like Natasha said, I am Abby Tobin, and I am really excited to be here with you all tonight to talk about bats and bat conservation in the Columbia River Gorge and beyond. Um, and I'm also really excited to see that most of you have seen bats before. That's great. That's, that's so awesome to see. Um, and so as Natasha said, I am the White Nose Syndrome Coordinator for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. So a lot of the work I will be talking about tonight is really specific to the work going on in Washington. Um, but I do work really closely with folks in Oregon and know that a lot of the projects I will be talking about are also occurring in Oregon. So I first just want to start off by sharing some bat facts um, that illustrate how diverse and unique bats are. Um, there are over 1,300 bat species in the world. And here in Washington, Oregon, we have 16 species. And bats have been found to live almost everywhere in the world. They've been found everywhere except in the extreme deserts or in polar regions. So bats really have developed unique um, physiological adaptations and behaviors to be able to live almost everywhere on Earth. So the smallest bat in the world is called the bumblebee bat, and that's the bat in that upper photograph there. And you can probably guess how it got its name. It's super tiny and it weighs less than a penny. And its wingspan, so if it stretches its wings out and you measure between the tip of the wings, it's about six inches. And this bat lives in Thailand and it eats, it eats really tiny spiders and beetles. And in comparison, the largest bat in the world is the giant golden crowned flying fox. And that's the bat in the photo below the bumblebee. And this bat um, has a wingspan of six feet. So almost as tall as most adult humans. And this bat lives in the Philippines um, and it likes to eat um, pollen from um, eucalyptus flowers and some fruits. Um, and so you can see there's a lot of different diversity between even just these two species, not in their size, but also um, in what they eat. So here in the gorge, um, our smallest bat is the canyon bat. And this bat has a wingspan of eight inches. So it's a little bit bigger than that bumblebee bat. And it weighs anywhere between three or four grams. So about the same weight if you were holding two gummy bears. And then our biggest bat is the hoary bat. And now the hoary bat has a wingspan of about um, 16 inches. So it's just about twice the size of a uh, canyon bat. And the hoary bat weighs about 26 grams. So roughly if you were holding about 13 gummy bears in your hand. So bats are also really unique because they are the only true flying mammal. You probably have heard of flying squirrels, um, but they actually don't fly, they only glide. And if you look at the, the skeleton of the, the bat, if you look at their wing, um, it looks very similar to our hand and our arms. They have a upper and lower arm, a wrist, a thumb and fingers that all make up their wing. Um, and actually the order that bats are in is called chiaptera, which means hand wing. And bats use echolocation, very similar to what dolphins do. Um, they use echolocation to navigate, to forage, and even to communicate. And so they emit these really high frequency sounds, oftentimes so they're outside of our hearing range. And they will emit these sounds in search of prey. Um, and if it hits an object, it'll send back sound waves to the bat and the bat can listen to that and figure out what that object is and whether it's a prey. And so all the bats here in the gorge in the Pacific Northwest feed on insects. And so they are the primary predators of nighttime insects. So that could be moths, mosquitoes, beetles, maybe some aquatic insects as well. And a lot of bats will catch insects in flight. They're capable of, of um, finding that, that insect using extra location and then using their tail to scoop up that insect and then munch on that bug in air. So it's quite, quite, uh, fascinating. And that lower photo there is an example of a bat taking it, having a little snack there. And you may have heard of the saying blind as a bat. Uh, bats actually aren't blind. They have pretty good eyesight. It can be similar to ours. So they can use their eyesight in addition to echolocation to navigate and to forage. And so bats are also a really important part of our ecosystem. They provide these essential ecosystem services, which, which means really how do humans benefit from bats. And 
bats will eat insects that can damage crops. So our agricultural um, industry can save billions of dollars in um, pesticide use annually because they will eat those, um, damage, those insects that will damage those crops. Um, they also feed on insects that can carry diseases. So like the mosquito, for example, can have Zika virus or West Nile virus. And then um, there are also some bats that feed on pollen and nectar. And so they are really important pollinators for a lot of plants. And so we don't have any bats in the Pacific Northwest that are pollinators. Um, those bats can be found um, in the Southwest United States, in just South America, and even in the tropics. And then there's also some bats that feed on fruit. And so they're really important in dispersing seeds and in with, in with reforestation. And I really love this diagram in the lower corner here. It's showing some examples of plants that benefit from bats. On the left side, you'll see uh, some examples of uh, crops that benefit from bats. Um, bats will eat the insects that will damage these crops. So example, there's a tomato and peppers and corn. And then in the middle there is an example of some of those plants that bats are important pollinators of. Um, for example, the agave cactus um, really depends on bats as pollinators. So without bats, um, we wouldn't have um, tequila. Um, but they also um, are really important in, in pollinating bananas and avocados. And then on that far right side are examples of plants that um, bats will eat the fruit and help disperse those seeds. So you have figs, mangoes, and papayas as an example there. And as I mentioned, um, all the bats here in the gorge and the Pacific Northwest are insectivores, so they only eat insects. So they really are important um, in controlling that pesky insect population up here. So the Columbia River, River Gorge is such a unique area. You have on the east side of it, you have these dry, uh, more rocky open habitats. And on the west side, you have these relatively more wet forested habitats that are all connected to this river without any of this a major landscape barrier like you have in just the north with the Cascade Mountains. And so because of that, you have a lot of connect connectivity between all these habitats which in turn means there's a lot more diversity in bat species. Um, so different species in these different types of habitat. And so of the 16 species found in Washington, Oregon, 13 have been found in the gorge area. So I want to talk a little bit about the roosting ecology of bats and, and what they're doing um, year round in the gorge. So during the summer, um, it's the time when females get together and they give birth and raise their young. And so most species will give birth to a single baby, which we call a pup. Um, but there are a few species that could have twins and they'll have one pup per year or twins per year, depending on the species. And there's some species that form colonies. Um, so we call them maternity colonies. And um, for some species, a maternity colony could consist of 10 to 20 bats. But for some other species, there could be a thousand bats in that colony. And then there are also some species that are solitary, even during maternity season. So the, the female will give birth and raise her young on her own. So when pups are born, they are completely dependent on their mothers. They cannot fly for at least four weeks. And so the mother will go out and forage and come back frequently and to nurse their pup. Um, and then towards the end of the summer though, bats, the, the pups are, more juveniles now and they are learning to fly and they're learning from the adults on places to forage and safe places to roost. And then as we start getting into the fall, those maternity colonies or the, um, they start dispersing and start moving to fall roosts where they are getting prepared for the winter. Um, and for a lot of species that means eating a lot of bugs and trying to get that. Um, but it's also the time when bats will mate or we, what we call swarming. And bats do this really neat thing called um, delayed fertilization, which means that they mate in the fall and then the females will become pregnant um, in the following spring. And then in the winter time, there are some species that will hibernate. So they'll stick around the gorge and hibernate um, throughout the winter. And, you know, we don't know a ton about the, um, what, where bats are hibernating. Um, we have found some bats that hibernate in caves or abandoned mines, but we suspect that there are other ones um, roosting in other tiny crevices and cliffs or in talus slopes or maybe in root wads and old trees. 
because um, here we, in the Pacific Northwest, we don't have these huge colonies of bats um, hibernating together, which we call a hibernacula. Um, you might have heard back in Eastern North America, there are some species that form hibernaculas with thousands, hundreds of thousands of bats in them. And we just don't have that occurring here. Um, we might have um, a few bats clustering together to hibernate, but more commonly we find them roosting by themselves. So it's likely the bats out here are more dispersed on the landscape and ut utilizing a lot of different types of roosts to hibernate. There's also a couple species that will migrate in the winter and they are capable of you know, flying hundreds of, hundreds of miles to warmer climates where there are more insects um, available to them. And then we're also starting to find that um, there are a few species that are active year round. And we particularly have found that in the mild climates and for example, in the lowlands of the Puget Sound area, we are finding that their bats are through the winter are out and about. And then, um, you know, as springtime comes, bats start emerging from hibernation uh, or bats are migrating back to the area and they start heading to their summer roosts and start getting ready for maternity season. And then that whole cycle starts again. And so I just wanted to highlight um, a couple species. Um, first, my favorite bat is the pallid bat. They are, it's the, the bat up in that top photo there. They are one of those species that likes to roost in rocky and more desert habitat. So they're found um, on the eastern side of the Cascades and the eastern part of the gorge. And they have this beautiful blonde fur and these big ears and they like to eat scorpions and centipedes. Um, they will fly really low to the ground using echolocation and their hearing to find their prey and they will land on the ground. They can, they're quite capable of, of actually crawling and maneuvering on the ground to catch their prey. And they are immune to the sting of a scorpion as well. So it's super neat um, what this bat does. Um, and they're also, um, like I said, they're able to maneuver on the ground and they can take to flight really easily from the ground as well, with, even with their prey in their mouth. And, and that's not common for other bat species. There's several that have a hard time taking to flight from the ground. And this bat is likely in the gorge year round. We actually don't know a ton about its roosting ecology. Um, we do suspect that they do form maternity colonies. Um, we do know in other parts of our region that there are maternity colonies, that there are about you know, 50 to 100 of these um, individuals roosting together. Um, and then we also do suspect that they hibernate in the area, but we don't know where. Um, same with their summer colonies. We don't know where they are. And so that's something that we hope to learn more about. And then moving on to another species, the hoary bat. That is the, the fo middle photo there. This species, like I said, is one of the, it's the largest one in the Pacific, Pacific Northwest. And it has this beautiful speckled gray white fur with a little bit of orange on its face. And they like to roost on trees, as you can see in this photo here. It's perfectly camouflaged with that bark of that tree. Um, but they also will roost in the foliage as well. And this bat um, tends to be um, solitary, so it will roost by itself more often. Um, a lester in the summertime, you might see, you know, adult with its pup. Um, or twins, this species can have twins. Um, and this is a species that will migrate. Um, it can, it's capable of migrating, I, th I think it's been documented around a thousand kilometers um, at, for its migration route for one individual. Um, but, you know, we don't know a ton, again, about what this bat is doing. Um, you know, for example, of the quarries that are in the gorge in the summertime, we don't actually know where they are spending their winters. And so, again, that's something we hope to learn more about. And then lastly, I just wanted to talk about the little brown bat. This is a pretty common bat. Um, it's found throughout um, Washington and Oregon. And this bat will form um, maternity colonies. It can have about you know, 100 individuals in a colony during the summertime, but it also will co-roost with another species called the Yuma myotis, and together they can form colonies in the thousands. Um, the biggest maternity colony that we know of in Washington has about 3,000 individuals in that colony. And um, they will select um, roosts um, in barns or in attics. They've been found in roofs or the side of people's houses. Um, we also can find them in bunkers and 
also in bat houses and even under bridges are some places that we have documented um, maternity colonies for this species. So in the winter time, we know that, that this species does hibernate, but again, we don't know a ton about where. Um, so you might starting to see a common theme here. We, we're missing a lot of important information about the roosting ecology for a lot of the bats in the area. But we do suspect that, you know, this bat could be, you know, they're roosting solitarily through the winter time when they're hibernating, perhaps in caves or abandoned mines, um, but they're probably likely also using those tiny crevices in cliffs or in talus slopes or even in, in old growth trees. <clears throat> so unfortunately, there are a lot of threats facing bats. Um, some of which include degraded or loss of roosting and foraging habitat. And that could be caused from you know, deforestation. There are um, some species that like to forage in forests or along the edges of them. Um, there are some species that will roost in the sloughing bark of trees or in snags. And so when those features are lost, that important habitat is taken away from bats. Also urbanization and climate change, of course, can all um, contribute to degraded or a loss of these important habitats for bats. And then disturbances at roost. Um, maternity season, so the summertime and during the winter when bats are hibernating are periods when um, it's very energetically demanding for bats. So if they're frequently disturbed, that could cause them to expend um, excess energy, which then can affect their survivorship. Um, it also could cause bats to abandon those roosts and go find another place to roost that maybe is less suitable, which in turn can affect its survivorship and its reproduction success. And then wind energy, unfortunately, is a threat to bats. Um, as you all probably know, in the gorge, there are a lot of um, wind turbines along the river. Um, and unfortunately, it's been particularly um, detrimental to migratory bat species. And for us here in the gorge, that would mainly be the hoary bat. And so what ends up happening is a lot of these hoaries, as they're migrating um, through, they can end up hitting these turbines. Or there's a phenomena called barotrauma, which basically means uh, as a bat approaches a wind turbine, the changing air pressure from the blades rotating can cause the bat's lungs to explode. So unfortunately, there has been documented hundreds of thousands of bat deaths um, annually across the, um, the United States from wind energy. Um, but luckily, there are a lot of researchers working with the wind energy industry to come up with solutions and find ways to, to reduce um, um, the number of bats being killed by wind energy. And then lastly, emerging infectious diseases which really just means new diseases entering into the bat population. And for bats, our, we're, we're mainly concerned with white nose syndrome. And um, I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on this um, as uh, my job um, is very involved with white nose syndrome. And it is one of those new threats that are facing bats up here in the Pacific Northwest. So white nose syndrome, it was first discovered in North America back in 2006, 2007, during that winter. Um, and, and it was found in New York. And it's, it's a, caused by a fungus. So white nose syndrome is the disease, but there's a fungus that's called Pseudogymnoascus destructans, or PD for short, that causes the disease. And so this is an invasive fungus. It, it likely came from Eurasia and it affects bats during hibernation. So that's really important to remember that it affects them while they're hibernating. And it's transmitted by you know, bats um, coming to contact with one another or a bat coming to contact with an environment that um, is contaminated that has that fungus present. Unfortunately, humans have been shown to spread the fungus as well. So either on your shoes or your clothing or perhaps some equipment that went into a place where this fungus was present and you can move it um, large distances, unfortunately. And that's how it's believed it got to North America in the first place. So white nose syndrome, it does not affect humans or other animals, um, but it can be deadly to bats. It can cause severe wing damage, as you can see in this upper photo here, which can result in the bat's loss in um, thermal regulation or water balance. It also can affect its ability to fly and to forage successfully. 
Um, it also is an irritant. So during hibernation, um, it could cause the bat to rouse more frequently, which causes it to deplete then its bat reserves that it needs to survive through the winter. So then ultimately, uh, the bat can become dehydrated and then starve to death. And for some species, the mortality rate has been documented to be over 90%. And in Eastern North America, it's been estimated that over 6 million bats have died from white nose syndrome. So it has the potential to be a, a, create a huge population of bats here. And so here is um, a spread map showing where either white nose syndrome, the disease has been found, or the fungus. And all those different shapes are counties in the United States and in Canada. Um, and the blue purple color are um, years, the earlier years when the, it was first detected, so back in 2006, and the red color is our most recent winter, so this 2019, 2000, um, 2020 um, winter. And you can see that um, there are several counties in Washington where we have found either white nose syndrome or the, fun the fungus itself. And so here's a close-up of Washington showing those counties, and the yellow county there, that is King County, and so that's where Seattle and North Bend are. Um, so back in 2016 is when we first documented white nose syndrome in Washington. And since then, um, we have found the disease in two additional counties. And then we've also found the fungus, but not signs of the disease yet, in three additional counties. And we know that there are at least four species in Washington to be susceptible to white nose syndrome. We do uh, suspect there are more species that will be vulnerable just based on what's been found in Eastern North America. But so far we know that these four in Washington are vulnerable. And that would be from left to right, the little brown bat, the Yuma myotis, the Western long ear myotis, and the fringe myotis. And that photo on the far right, um, that is a silver haired bat. And that bat has been found to have the fungus, but not the disease itself. Um, which is a little concerning because this bat is capable of flying long distances over a really relatively short period of time. And so it has the potential to move the fungus across the landscape um, and introduce it to a new bat population. And so, you know, after the discovery of white nose syndrome and also just considering all these other threats facing bats, you know, one of the main questions us managers have is, you know, what are the potential impacts going to be on the Pacific Northwest bat populations. And like, are we going to see high mortality rates like they did in Eastern North America for Marino syndrome? Are we going to see just huge population crashes? Um, and so there's a lot of unknowns about the roosting ecology that I've already talked about that, that do make it hard to, to fully answer that question. So as an example, you know, we don't know which species in the area are hibernating and then thus are vulnerable to white nose syndrome. And for those that do hibernate, we don't know where they're hibernating and whether the conditions in those roosts are suitable for the disease and for the bat to be vulnerable there. And then we also don't know where maternity roosts are, so what bats are doing in the summer. And we know bats aren't vulnerable during that period um, to white nose syndrome, but they are vulnerable to other threats during that period. Um, and so find, knowing where all these roosts are and what bats are doing throughout the year um, provides us the opportunity to monitor bat health and also just to monitor trends. Um, but so without that knowledge, it makes it difficult to assess how the population is being impacted. So, you know, that, that main question and, and a lot of these unknowns have really helped um, steer our strategy and our path forward to how we can conserve bats in the face of white nose syndrome and other threats. And so one of those things that we are doing um, is outreach. Um, we want to work with the public. We want the public to understand the importance of bats, what, what those threats are to bats, and how they can help us um, work together to protect and conserve the bat populations here. And so we have created um, stickers and brochures and posters and lots of other materials that we, we take with us when we go to events. Um, we try to bring in the middle photo here, we have bat skin, so folks can see what a natural bat looks like up close and just to see how, how neat they are. Um, we also work closely with a lot of federal, state, and tribal agencies and nonprofits in this outreach efforts. Um, in particular, there's a group out of Seattle called Bats Northwest, and they do a lot of outreach and, and a lot of great messaging about bat conservation. 
Um, and so Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife also has a social media presence. So we are on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, and we occasionally try to do features on bats, again, just to, to get people interested in bats. And so we hope when people are interested, they'll care and then want to protect bats. And then we also have created a, um, a few bat educational trunks is what we call them. And inside these trunks, there are all these different activities for kids. And teachers, educators, anyone that works with kids can rent these trunks from us and take them to their classrooms. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, please get in touch with me and I can help connect you with the, the right offices where you can rent those. And throughout our whole outreach efforts, um, one thing we're always encouraging the public to do is to report bat observations um, to your wildlife agency. So for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, that is our link there at the bottom. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife also has a reporting tool on their website that you can Google and find. Um, but we really just want to hear from the public um, about you know, sick, injured, or, or dead bats, and live bats, groups of bats. All the information really helps us learn more about bats in the area. And then we also are doing surveillance. And when I say surveillance, that means just we're looking for where white nose syndrome is in the state of Washington. And like I said, you know, this is all specific to Washington, but at Oregon is also doing this as well. And so we really want to figure out, um, you know, where the disease is and which species are vulnerable to it. So to do that, we um, visit colonies that we know of and we capture bats and we collect samples from them. And so when we do that, it's um, a pretty quick process. We basically use something that looks like a Q-tip and we just roll it on the wing of the bat and on its nose. And we take a couple of measurements and that bat then ready to go. So they're released unharmed and we try to do it as quick as possible. Um, but we also can collect other samples that give us great information about um, where the fungus is. So like guano, for example, which is bat droppings. That's a great non-invasive way for us to, to look at where the fungus can be in the state. We also go to several caves um, to collect samples, to, again, look for this fungus. So we go to caves around Mount St. Helens and um, Mount Adam the state of Washington, and so we try to go to those sites as well. Again, just to look for signs of the disease on bats roosting there and just to get samples as well. And then we also work really closely with bat rehabbers and the Department of Health in the state. And they've been really great in helping us um, find new cases of the disease. So any bat that comes into their facility, they will look for signs of the disease and take samples for us. And so, like I said, it's just been a great partnership and really has helped us learn more about the disease. In addition to that, the public, through that online reporting tool, um, any dead bat reports that come through between December and June, I will collect those and test them for white nose syndrome. And so the public has really been a huge help in hel helping us uh, identify new places where the disease is um, and new species that are susceptible to it. And so in the gorge, um, there are five roosts that we sample. Um, we don't sample all five each year. We try to rotate through all those sites. And um, luckily to date, um, all those sites have come back negative for the disease and the fungus. So that's great news and let's hope it continues to be that way in years to come. Then we're also trying to learn more about the roosting ecology. Like I've talked about before, you know, we don't know where a lot of these bats are. Um, especially during the summertime and the winter time. Um, but for some of the sites that we do know about, um, we try to go out to, to them in the summer and do counts. So we sit out there and we'll count bats as they emerge from the roost. And that gives us an idea of, you know, colony sizes and allows us to look at trends over time and which can allow us to see, you know, the general health of that colony and the population in that area. Um, and we also are trying to find new colonies. That way, again, we can learn more and, and when we can know more about these species, we can better protect them. And so the public has been a huge help, again, in helping us find new colonies. Through that online reporting tool, folks have been reporting groups of bat to us. And we try to go out to all those reports to verify it's a colony, try to figure out what species are there and how many are there. And um, since we started having that online reporting tool, we have documented 60 new maternity colonies in the state. 
Um, and here in the gorge, there have been eight new roosts. So that's just so exciting to, to know that this is happening and that we're learning so much about bats over, over a relatively short period of time. And I would really love, you know, to have that number in the gorge go up. So if you know of any groups of bats, bat colonies in your area, you know, please let me know. Or if you can just spread the word to your neighbors, your community that we are interested in this information, that would be awesome. Because um, we would love to, to work with you to monitor these bat colonies. And then we're also doing acoustic monitoring. And so, um, Acoustic monitoring works by using a specialized microphone. It picks up the high frequency sounds that bats emit when they're echolocating, and each species has a unique call. So we're able to tell which species are where and when, and that allows us to see how bats are using certain habitats. And again, that will help us then start to understand how we can best can protect these habitats for bats. There also is a program called the North American Bat Monitoring Program, or NABAT for short. And this is a huge collaborative effort between state, federal, tribal agencies, nonprofits, non-governmental agencies, um, all monitoring bats on the landscape. Um, and this work is all coordinated um, by a group out of Oregon State University called the Northwest Bat Hub. Um, and so all this data is um, gathered in, in hopes of looking at regional trends in bats activity. And so in the gorse, there are a few sites that are part of that effort. And then I wanted to just mention radio telemetry. Um, you know, we haven't been doing any telemetry in the gorge. Um, we've only done this up in the Snoqualmie Pass area. But I just wanted to mention that, you know, we have this tool we can use to learn more about roosting ecology. Um, so how it works is you can attach a really tiny transmitter to the back of the bats using um, surgical glue. And so that, that transmitter eventually will fall off. And, um, we're then able to use uh, telemetry to track that bat to its roost. And so it's a way to help us, again, learn more about where bats are roosting and then ways that then we can potentially um, protect those roosts. And in particular, we've been trying to use this to find hibernacula um, so we can make better um, white nose syndrome management um, strategies. <clears throat> and then I just wanted to end on, you know, how can you help bats? You know, I think first off, just really being a bat ambassador is super important. Um, learn as much as you can about bats and then share that information with your friends, your family, your neighbors. Um, I don't think you, you could be, you know, I started my son off uh, a super early age, as you can see in that top photo uh, of him becoming a bat ambassador. Um, and, you, and for those of you who don't know that this um, week is called Bat Week and it's a week to celebrate all things bats. Um, and batweek.org is a great resource for you to get started on learning more about bats. There's a ton of great um, activities and videos in there for you to, to start looking into um, to learn more about bats. And then reporting bats in your area to your wildlife agency. Like I mentioned, that has been such a great help for us here in Washington to learn more about bats. Um, so go to your wildlife agency's website and a lot of us now have these reporting tools that you can easily submit a report. Um, and just as an example, I wanted to mention this middle photo here. Um, there's a gentleman in the white salmon area that has bats frequently on his property. Um, so he periodically will send me some photos of his visitors. And here is a pallid bat uh, roosting in his uh, woodshed. So I, I love seeing um, these photos from people. And then, you know, do not disturb bats um, when they're in their maternity colonies or when they're roosting. Um, and then and please don't handle bats. There is a small uh, percentage of bats that can carry rabies and you can get rabies um, when you handle a bat and it can bite you. Um, so in, in order to avoid that, please don't pick up any bats that you find on the ground. If you do find one, please call your wildlife agency or even a bat rehabber and they can help advise you on what to do there. And then um, promoting um, natural foraging habitat. You know, you can plant a native garden, uh, reduce pesticide use on your property, all of which will um, enhance your insect population, which in turn will um, attract bats. And then also provide safe roosting habitat. Um, if you have any snags on your property that can stay um, safely be there, um, I encourage you to keep those since there are some bats that roost in snags. Um, and also building a bat house. Um, there's a lot of factors that can go into whether a bat house will become occupied. Um, but when it, when it is, it can be a really great place and a safe place for bats to roost. 
Um, as an example, there is a gentleman in Washougal that has installed, um, I think, six bat houses um, on his property. And over a relatively short period of time, he now has a maternity colony of a little brown bats roosting in those bat houses there. So I think there's about 300. So it's really awesome to hear about these success stories with bat houses. Um, and so it definitely is possible to provide these safe places for bats. So these are just some examples of things you can do to help bats, and I'm sure there's a lot more things you will find as you start um, down the path of becoming a bat ambassador. Um, so with that, I, I just want to thank you all so much for tuning in tonight and listening to me talk about bats. Um, if you have any other questions, um, my email is down there at the bottom, and so please feel free to email me questions or comments or just any bat observations you have had over the years. I, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so again, thank you. And then I will, um, I guess, turn it back over to you, Natasha. Yes. Thank you, Abby. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, yeah. We are now going to go into Q&A. Um, again, please type all of your questions for Abby into the Q&A box below in that black toolbar, and we'll get to them as quick as we can. We've only got uh, roughly about 12 or 10, 15 minutes or so. Um, Again, if you're having trouble using the Q&A interface, uh, you can also raise your hand with the hand, uh, raise hand function also at the bottom of your computer screen. Um, okay, let's just get straight into it. Um, also, just a friendly reminder that uh, we are recording this webinar, so it will be posted within a few days. The entire recording will be posted on our YouTube channel. All right, let's get into a few questions here. Thank you everybody for sending in your questions. It's, it's really awesome. I'm, I'm seeing a few here. We're gonna try to get to as many as we can. Um, so Bill Weiler would like to know, approximately how many mosquitoes or moths do bats in the Northwest consume every evening? Good question. You know, and I don't know the exact answer to that. That's, it could be tough to quantify that. Um, but what I've heard is that a bat can eat its weight of, of insects in a night. So think of a, a, the candy bat, for example, like I mentioned, weighs three to four grams. So it can roughly eat that much um, insects in a night. So I don't know how much a mosquito weighs, but um, you could probably do the math there and figure that out. Um, but there also are, a lot, are some publications out there that have kind of gone through all that math and, and try to quantify that. But unfortunately, I don't know. But that's a great question. Thank you. Um, also, I, I see a few questions in the chat box. Remember, you guys, please send your um, questions into the Q&A box so we don't miss them. Um, I see a few in the regular chat box, and I appreciate your guys' questions, but just so I don't miss them, please send them into the Q&A. Um, real quick, given the continued use of pesticides, are you seeing a loss in the amount of insects available for bat consumption? And that's another great question that I Unfortunately, don't have a good answer to. Um, you know, I really focus on you know, the roost oncology side of, of, of bat management, um, and I don't know much about the insect side. Um, there are researchers like entomologists that do look at that sort of um, changes over time of insect availability, particularly related to pesticide use. Um, so once again, I don't know the answer, but, you know, I'd be happy to um, follow up with you if you send me an email. We could talk about that via email as I get a chance to read a little bit more about that. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Um, a few different questions folks are asking about, you know, has, is the fungus centered in the United States? Um, has it spread to Central or Southern America? Um, yeah, is it, is it worldwide? I hope not. Yeah, so it's, so the white nose has been found in Eurasia, and so it's believed it, orig it came from there. Um, and what they have found is that the bats that are hibernating in Europe and Asia, they do develop signs of white nose syndrome, but they are not seeing these mass mortality. Um, so they believe that's because bats have evolved over time with the fungus and the disease. Um, and so bats have either changed their behaviors, like when they're, how they're roosting and where they're roosting to adapt with that fungus. So, we're, so again, they're not seeing those mass mortalities. Um, so then they believe then that it got introduced to North America 
um, likely from a person. Um, and since it's a new disease, bats have not evolved with it um, here in North America. And that's why it has such an impact on the populations. Um, and so it has been found um, throughout the United States. Um, I think I show that spread map there, um, but also into Canada. Um, it's been found in several provinces up there, um, but it hasn't been found in Mexico or South America to my knowledge yet. Thank you. We're just gonna keep going because we got so many here. Um, Don and Linda, <laughs> how high should a bat, bat, box, excuse me, at home or whatnot, how high should they be mounted? Yeah, great question. You know, the, the higher the better. Um, I think the range is, you know, 10 to 12 feet um, is ideal, um, maybe minimum eight feet. Um, you just wanna make sure you have um, enough space for bats to drop and fly. Um, so, like I mentioned before, bats, as they take the flight, they need a little bit of space to, to start flying. So that's why that's important. Also, just the potential risk from predation. So just having it mounted higher is also um, more favorable for bats. Um, and on that note, um, if you can install a bat house on a pole or even a building, it's more ideal. Um, try to avoid mounting them on a tree. Um, it seems from what I've read that um, there's less success in bat houses becoming occupied when they're mounted on trees. And that could be related to um, maybe they're, they're vulnerable to predation there or they're just not um, enough sunlight to, to really heat up that box enough that would that makes it suitable for bats. So just something else to keep in mind if you're considering installing a bat house. Thank you. Um, okay, so, uh, sorry, I'm going through here. Um, Bob would like to know, what should you do when bats begin living in your house? I don't know if that's, uh, maybe if you just find a bat on your property or yeah, somewhere around your house, what should you do? Who should you contact? Yeah, so, so if this is an individual bat, um, that likely that individual is just hanging out for a few days and will leave on its own. Um, but if you have a colony of bats in your home um, and you want them there, great. That's great, you know, leave them there. But if you don't, I, that's totally understandable. Um, there are ways that you can safely exclude bats um, and then also providing like a bat house as an altern alternative place for them to roost. Um, so you can talk to your wildlife agency folks. Um, there are licensed wildlife control operators who are, some of which who are trained in excluding bats. Um, we usually recommend that um, you avoid excluding bats during the summer. Um, again, that's the maternity season. So um, that's when the females are having their pups and they're really vulnerable during that period um, and pups can't fly for the you know, first four weeks or so. So we just encourage folks to avoid excluding um, during that period, um, just so they don't um, potentially trap flightless young inside the structure that they're trying to get bats out of. Um, and there, there are a lot of different methods to, you know, exclude or like one-way doors so bats can get out but not back in. Um, and so just starting to do that process in the fall um, is what we usually recommend. But again, you know, you can talk to a wildlife agency or, or a wildlife control operator who can, you know, talk specifics about your, your colony that you're trying to get rid of. Thank you. Um, uh, two or three of you have asked, what kind of bat are we looking at on the screen there in that photo? Oh. Yeah, that's the uh, Townsend big-eared bat. I, I, was, I was tossing up what species I should highlight during this presentation, and, and they were close, close, you know, third, fourth, because <laughs> uh, they're also a really fascinating bat um, who are in the gorge year-round, um, and they will form those maternity colonies, and they hibernate um, also in the area. Um, typically in caves or abandoned mines, you often find that that species hibernating. Um, but they're, they're one of my favorites too. They're just super cute with their big ears and big eyes. <laughs> All right. Um, Randy would like to know, how do I keep paper wasps from making nests in my bat house? Yeah, that's a great question too. And that's um, something for folks that um, trying to put up bat houses just to keep in mind that you should regularly check your bat houses for that because um, they do, wasps like to, to build nests in there and that can discourage bat use. Um, you know, what I've heard is that um, the spacings in between um, inside the bat houses, um, even if reducing that size, even like a quarter inch can sometimes discourage wasps um, but still be big enough for bats to use. Um, but sometimes it's, it's just um, sticking, uh, keeping up with them and trying to, to knock them out of there as often as you can. Um, 
Yeah, if, if you didn't want to rebuild your bat house. Yeah. But I wouldn't encourage putting any um, insecticides or sprays in there as that could, you know, affect bats as well. Um, Sharon would like to know, is there any way to eradicate the fungus without harming the bats once it is found? <laughs> That's also another great question, and, and that's something that um, a lot of researchers are working on right now. Um, there are a lot of different treatments um, that show promise, um, but, you know, so they show promise in the laboratory setting. Um, they, so, for example, um, uh, folks have found different bacterias or viruses or um, other like microorganisms that can be found naturally in bat wings or in the environment um, that inhibit the growth of the fungus. Um, so then, you know, researchers are trying to find a way, can we apply that same kind of cocktail of probiotics and organisms into where bats are hibernating as a way, either into the environment or on the bats as a way to inhibit the growth of the fungus. Um, but there are still some questions of how that might impact the other native organisms in those environments. Um, and that's still just still being researched. So there's some kind of pilot work going on right now trying to trial how that might impact other organisms. Um, another example, um, they found that UV light, um, exposing a bat or the environment to UV light is pretty effective in um, killing the fungus. Mm. So that's another thing folks are trying to figure out, like if we use that in a cave as bats fly in and out, is that gonna affect other organisms that are using those systems as well? Um, something else that's also showing promise is a vaccine. Um, I don't know a ton about the vaccine, how it's going to work, but and how it's going to be applied. I think that's one of the challenges is trying to figure out how you can give a vaccine to a bunch of bats to help them <laughs> survive an infection with whiteness syndrome. So it's a great question and it's something that a lot of folks are interested in and really want to figure out. And, 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 and that's one of the reasons why we're trying to learn a lot about the roots oncology up here so that if there ever is a treatment that is safe and effective, we'll find places, we'll know places now that we could do some sort of treatments. Mm -hmm. um, alrighty, so Michael would like to know, is there a preference by bats of lava tube versus limestone caves for habitats in Washington and Oregon? Um, you know, I think it's probably just based on, you know, the, the area the bats are in. Um, so it's like, so the towns in Bigger Bat, for example, here, um, they are commonly found in lava tubes and in limestone caves. Um, but, you know, in the, around Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, uh, to my knowledge, there's not a lot of limestone. So it's, it's all basalt and lava tubes. And so, that's where you find those bats, they're in those caves. Um, but in other parts of the Western United States, you'll find Townsend's and other bats only in limestone caves. So I think it's really just depends on what type of habitats are available to the bats themselves. Um, and for other species though, um, like I mentioned, we don't know a lot about where they're going, what they're doing. And so perhaps there are some species that do prefer um, some of the basalt caves. Um, because of maybe there's more availability of cracks, because there are some bats that prefer, they're, they're crevice dwelling bats. So they like to get in these tiny little spaces and tuck up in there. Um, whereas they're like the Townsend like to roost out in the open. Um, so a lot of those different, the, you know, the availability of those features might influence um, the, a bat's preference. Um, so can, can sorry, Martise, can providing a bat house on private property lessen the spread of white nose syndrome since the bats living there are in a small specific colony? Um, you know, it's, I don't know if it would necessarily slow it. Um, so when, so the fall period is when bats potentially might come exposed to the fungus and then take it back to, you know, their hibernacula or they either get um, exposed to it in hibernation. And so during the summer months, we're not as concerned with their exposure there. Um, so in the fall though, bats tend to move around a bunch. And like I mentioned, it's mating season, so they're swarming. And so there could be a lot of interaction happening, um, which then caught, could be a lot of potential for spreading the fungus. And then bats then carrying that fungus to wherever they're wintering. Um, so those are the periods that we are concerned about it, um, but we're still learning so much about it. Um, 
and, and again, how these bat behaviors might influence how it's being spread. Because again, we just don't know a lot, um, unfortunately. So that's, you know, that's something that we hope to, you know, we're trying to focus on here. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I'm not pronouncing your name incorrectly, but um, Marie, um, recent studies show that painting one of each three turbine blades a dark contrasting color results in very significant reduction of bird mortality from wind turbine strikes. Do you know, does this simple fix help reduce bat mortality? Yeah, you know, I don't know specifically about that. Um, what I have heard is um, the cut-in rate or time, apologies if I got that term wrong, um, if you delay that so that they're operating at higher wind speeds has shown to cut 50 to even 80% of bat mortalities. Um, Cause basically it's saying, you know, once the winds are strong enough, you probably won't see as much bat activity because a lot of species tend to avoid flying during high winds. So that's one thing that I know researchers have been trying to encourage some of the facilities to, to adapt to or um, to implement is slowing that cut in or delaying that cut in time. Um, and then um, I've also heard of folks um, trialing using, um, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, they're like acoustic broadcasters to turn. So they will emit these like high sounds and just try to um, maybe confuse bats or just cause them to avoid those turbines before they approach them. Um, so those are two of the things I've heard that are shown success and that are still kind of being evaluated how they can be implemented. Uh, but potentially that could work because um, like I said, bats do use their eyesight um, to, 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 um, to forage or to navigate. Um, and one of the thoughts is that um, quarry bats are particularly hit hard from the wind energy um, because you know they tend to roost in trees. And so the thought is that some of the wind turbines could look like trees, so they're trying to find some roosts. So potentially if you change any of that feature of that turbine so it doesn't look like a, a tree, then maybe that'll decrease uh, mortalities as well. And I'm sorry, you guys, we're running out of time. I think we might only get to two or three more depending on um, how long, but um, again, just want to thank everybody for joining us. And I have gotten a few messages about folks that were um, let in later. I guess Eventbrite had some difficulties and weren't letting people in till 530. So I really apologize to anybody that wasn't able to get in. I just want to say, sorry, you weren't in um, at five. And uh, of course, um, you know, we will have the recording posted on our YouTube channel. Okay, a few quick ones. Uh, what message would you give to the general public about how we can ensure we're not helping to spread the fungus that causes white nose syndrome? What precautions could we take when recreating? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think the first thing is avoid bat roosts um, when you can, um, not only for the spreading the fungus, but just to not disturb bats. Um, but there is a, um, a protocol, it's a national decontamination protocol that's online and it goes through things you can do if you do encounter um, bats or, or you happen to walk into a bat roost. Um, there are products like cleaning products that are effective in killing the fungus. Um, so, you know, example like isopropyl alcohol or um, bleach, you know, are, are things that a lot of us have that um, you can use to, to clean your footwear or clothing. Um, so I encourage you, you know, to check out that um, protocol. It's, it's a simple, it's on whitenosesyndrome.org. It's a, a, a great website. I should have put it on here for you, for you folks. It's another great place to start learning more about the disease and um, where it is. And, and again, that decontamination protocol is there. Um, so, and so when I work with a lot of the, the public who have bat roost, again, just encouraging them to, to if they're going to travel across the country or elsewhere in the state, um, and they happen to have a bunch of equipment or clothing that have been in contact with that bat roost on their property for a long time, just to, to be conscious of that and try not to even use that clothing or footwear um, when you travel. Um, or if you do, just really make sure you do a thorough cleaning job of that stuff. I was muted, sorry about that. Um, so some folks say that they haven't seen bats on their property. Besides doing the things that you mentioned, planting a native garden and still installing bat houses, is there anything else um, that can be done? And, and they said, of course, thanks for the informative program. Uh, to attract bats to their property, is that the? Yes, I believe so, to help bats and attract bats to their property, but um, of course, mainly just help them. I believe. 
Yeah, I mean, again, I think the, the best thing to help bats is to be that bat ambassador. Because um, as a lot of you probably know, bats get a bad rap. Um, you know, they're part of all the horror stories and people are really scared of them. And I think our first step in conserving bats is to really educate folks that you know, they aren't this big, scary, mysterious animal and they really are really great. They're cute, but, and they're also really beneficial and they deserve our respect and, and us protecting them. Um, so I think that's the first step. Um, but, you know, I, you know, other than the things I mentioned with the native habitat or pr providing roost, um, I, I don't know what else you can do, to be honest. Um, you know, I, will, I try to track bats to my house all the time, um, but they still haven't used my bat house. Um, so um, I think, you know, as you start on your, your search of learning more about bats, perhaps you'll find some other things it, specific to your area that might help. Great. Um, you guys, I'm, I'm so sorry for anybody, you all, that we couldn't get to, but um, we are out of time. Thank you so much, Abby, for joining us and uh, giving us all of this knowledge and answering all these questions for us. Again, thank you to everybody for joining us. If you want to contact Abby, if you have any of your questions that you really wanted answered, there's Abby's contact information right there on that main slide. Give her an email. Feel free to give me an email. I can forward them to Abby. But again, thank you so much, Abby, for your time. And thank you, everybody, for, for joining us live this afternoon. Have a yeah. good night, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Take care. <laughs>